Hello, and welcome back to The Intersect. We are joined today by a very good friend of ours and special guest, Bridget Bestacker. Bridget is the founder of Managing Your Fertility, an online one-stop shop of fertility awareness resources for women and couples. Bridget helps women step boldly into their womanhood by being unafraid of their cycles and bodies, embracing their reproductive health in all its glory and messiness. Heck yeah. She's on a mission to integrate faith and science through compassion and connection with her website, courses launching soon, podcasts, writing, and speaking engagements. Bridget is married to David, and together they have two sweet girls where they live out the beautiful mess of NFP and marriage together every day. So welcome, Bridget. Thank you guys for having me. I'm so excited to be here with you too. This is great. Yeah, we're going to have fun today. This is another episode that we did not plan because we literally talk to Bridget like every day. Yeah. So we're like, you know, <laughs> we just don't need to plan this one. But before we jump into what we're going to talk about today, um, I have to tell a little story of meeting Bridget because this is funny. So of course, like we are on complete opposite sides of the country. Mary's down in New Orleans. I'm up here in Virginia. And Bridget is 30 minutes away from my in-laws up in Minnesota. So naturally we got to see each other over Christmas, but I'm a Louisiana girl, as I have shared before, when like down in Louisiana, if we get like a hint of snow, we go apocalyptic mode. If it goes below 32 degrees, we are like worried about our pipes busting. Um, yeah, like hardcore. And I know Bridget, you're just kind of like, oh, that's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> we close so schools I, down when it's not even freezing. I wish that was my freezing. reality. <laughs> Okay. So that's the picture painted of like, you know, the difference between us. When I met Bridget, we met at this awesome brewery and we sat outdoors two days after Christmas in 10 degree weather. And I'm pretty sure that I was like manic because I was so cold that I'm like shaking. Bridget thought that I was just a really exciting, bubbly person. And I'm like, no, I am like moving and going crazy because I'm so cold and I'm trying to stay warm. The best part was my phone died because it was so cold. And yeah. Is that yeah. a thing that happens? <laughs> yes. It's a super normal thing. And what you do, <laughs> David and I immediately like at the same time, we're like, Emily, just put your, put your phone in your shirt, like put it by your boobs. <laughs> <laughs> And Emily's like, stop, what are you talking about? We're like, just put it in there, warm it right up, pull it back out. It's going to turn right back on. It'll be up to like half your battery life. No problem. And she was mortified, but she did I, it. I was not mortified. I was just like, I can't believe, like, this horrified is weather that- than Horrified better, maybe horrified that this is what no, we do. No, I was just like, I, I, it was more of just the realization that- cutting edge technology is just like no to this weather and people live oh. in it <laughs> oh, yeah the amount of times that we've said like apple doesn't really understand their target market because we love phones that don't die when it's 20 degrees out or when you're on a walk for 20 minutes and your phone's dead and your music dies and everything's just dead it's dead yeah that was you had the true Minnesota experience though. Like I you did. are a true Minnesotan now because you sat outside. We had dinner outside by fires. Our boots melted. They did because yeah. we stuck them up on the fire pit because it was yep. so hot and the rubber on our soles like started to melt. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yep. But it was great. We had a great time. <laughs> our husbands got to meet each other and got along famously. It was so fun my husband's from Wisconsin. And so Minnesota, Wisconsin, like speaking everybody's language. I mean, love. Yeah. Great. Yes. Oh, it was so great. But yeah. 10 degrees. And I did it. I'm like really proud of myself for that. You should be. You should be. <laughs> I do wish though. I do wish our schools closed when it was like 30 degrees and it's like, sorry guys, you can't go because the days that I spent waiting for a bus high school and college, and it's like yeah. blowing snow and you're like, well, it's 10 degrees, but Apparently this isn't dangerous for anybody. So here we are. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, it was just the threat of a freeze and Bella's school closed and it didn't even actually freeze. So I'm like, why is my daughter missing school right now? <laughs> <laughs> I think I got one snow day in high school and I don't think I got any while I was in college. Man. All right. Time to move down South. <laughs> yeah, for no. real. I know. People like, can hit on California all they want, but I'm like, set me up with a coastal town. 
Ooh, I'm there. Yeah. I'm not attached. You know, I love my family, yeah. but the weather, eh. but spring's coming. So I'm going to change my tune again. I'm going to be like, I love it here. It's great. So, I will so. give y'all this. We visited my in-laws in August. It was glorious. I sat on the back patio in the middle of the afternoon and read a book and didn't die. I've never experienced that before. It was pleasant. There was a cool breeze. And I was just like, what is this? I was like, okay, if this is what summer is like, you know, cause my husband's like telling me stories of like going camping as a kid. And I'm just like, does not compute like humidity and mosquitoes and like feels like death. And he's like, no, it was nice. And I'm like, I'll take your word for it. But now I get it. Anyway, I think we have done enough small talk about the weather. <laughs> this is again true Minnesotan form. Like the weather is actually interesting to talk about. It isn't like even wow. a small, it's like, oh, hey, did you make it out of your driveway today and hit anything? No, great. Awesome. Yeah, that ice was crazy, wasn't it? I mean, it's super real. It's That's super wild. Real. We just had a snowstorm too. So it's top of mind again. Well, Godspeed. <laughs> Anyway, so today we are talking about the importance of collaboration over competition. And this is a little bit of a self-indulgent episode, I'll be totally honest. Um, and we are kind of speaking more to fertility awareness professionals than just fertility awareness users, because I know that we are also aware of, you know, like the method wars type of thing and you know, they, there's just kind of this natural human inclination towards competition. But, you know, when I was reading Bridget's bio, like all of our listeners were like, gosh, this really sounds a lot like fan base. And it's like, yeah. But the thing yeah. is, is that we are two totally different organizations, even though we're trying to do the same thing. We are a totally different flavor. And we recognize that is good. And we recognize the value of both of us being in this space, doing similar things with a similar, with a, with a totally different flavor, because different people are going to like one of us, not like the other and vice versa. So, um, I've always admired you, Bridget, for just kind of like putting that first of no, if we're in the business of like serving women, then we don't care about competition because that doesn't serve anybody that we recognize that we're all different and that's good. And we all need to be in this space. Well, thank you. I mean, I admire you guys so much in the work that you're doing. And I think a lot of it stems from, well, I think a lot of it stems from my mom and my aunt always talking about how women need to work together and we're strong and we're stronger together and not in a hoorah, rah, feminism, like men are bad. It was just that like, we as women contribute so much good and we contribute good when we work together. And when we do things together and we try to see like, where can we like align instead of always the infighting and the cat fighting that happens. And then I think some of it really stemmed from my previous job. There was a lot of women on women getting angry at each other, creating drama that was totally unnecessary. And I was absolutely burned out by it. I was absolutely burned out. So I think when I came into this space, part of me was like, thank God, I'm going to be a lone wolf. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm not going to talk to anybody. And I quickly realized like, one, I'm not made for that. No one is. We're made for community. And two, like I really wanted good experiences with colleagues. I really wanted people that could be colleagues and friends and like fighting towards the same thing. We're fighting this in the same fight and we're wanting the same thing. So how can we work together? So I, I actually remember reaching out to you, Emily, because I had not, like, I, I think I started um, engaging more on social media, like last year, maybe a year and a half ago when I started getting more disinterested in my current job. I was working part-time. So I was like, well, I have a little more time and I'm home, home with my first girl. And so like, I'm just going to hang with my daughter and show up a little bit more. And I found your account. And I was like, I had this moment of like, oh, she's already doing what I'm trying to do. Like, why am I even showing up? And then I was like, okay, why am I immediately like putting on this voice and listening to this voice? that's like, you're not enough. Stay small, stay comfortable. Don't show up. It's not worth it. Nobody needs you. And I, I remember like reaching out to you. I can't even remember what the question was. I, it was something, something related to sex. And I was like, so curious because I was just like, I don't know the answer to this or so it was something related to that. You were so friendly and so nice. And it wasn't like one of those things where somebody puts out their content and they're like, Hey, 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 this is so great. And then they like ghost you in the DMS or they're like super whatever. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this is so nice. And we just started chatting away and we like hit it off. And I was like, Oh my gosh, 
gosh, like these things exist. Like it's possible to like meet nice people and hit it off and actually work together. And from there, I just remember like chatting with you about things and same for Mary, you introduced me to Mary and I was like, who's Mary? So I like really just got this whole introduction to a space of like super awesome women who are like, you guys are the real deal. You're like actually nice and you actually show up online for people and offline you know because instagram is one of those things like the influencer world where you're like yeah yeah i think they're a total b behind the scenes and turns out like that's not always true which is so refreshing and it's been i think just healing for my own heart to be like wow i like work with women in this space who i genuinely enjoy and would get together over Christmas break or want to like go on a trip together. Like that's my dream with you guys. Like let's go on a trip somewhere. So I just think that's, that's been so rewarding and so fun that it doesn't have to be this like clicky club, That that's not a thing. It's so true too, because the, the way that Emily received you when you reached out to her, like the way she responded to you could have either taken you down a few pegs, but it didn't, it built you up which allowed you to grow in who you are and the mission that you're trying to accomplish. So we have a really big responsibility, I think, in that way to encourage each other, because then we help each other to become who we're meant to be in this space. We're all, we all could be saying the same exact things, but we're saying it in different ways. And there's only one person who can say it like Bridget does. And only one person who can say it like Emily does. And, you know, a lot of people, I think, can, it can affect a lot of people. And some people will maybe gravitate towards one of you or the other. But at the same, in the same time, it's just, it's so nice. To, we just receive things in different ways. So that's so valuable. Yeah. And I'm so glad that you didn't listen to that little lying voice of, oh, she's already doing that because I get tired of being the person saying stuff. <laughs> And I think like, that's the thing is that we've all realized is that it's like, like getting into the, trying to address all the issues with fertility awareness education and within all the spheres is like playing whack-a-mole and you need a lot of people at the whack-a-mole table to keep them all down. You can't do it by yourself. You know, it's like, it's not like you, you need everybody, like all hands on deck what is your gift? What is your gift? Oh my gosh, use it. I don't care if you're saying the same thing as me. I don't need to be the only one saying it because I get tired. Like I got kids and it's like, I can't say this all day because it's like a tantrums half the time. So, you know, I mean, like all hands on deck, all of us doing this together is so, so, so important because, you know, I think it's, it's also like recognizing like, even as we are all in this space, we're all so passionate about what we do. We love what we do. It feeds us so much, but at the same time, it can be draining. And so being able to work with other people in the space and wreck it, like being able to have a wor- a legit work-life balance because we do have these colleagues, but in like the coolest way, it's like, oh, we're colleagues, but we're colleagues of like different organizations that could be competing, but aren't. Yeah, I think what can be challenging is the, a lot of the language, I think, in, in the business world and business training, like, you know, your, your desire, your goal should be, you know, you need to be number one, you need to be number one in the space, number one in the space. And while like, there's merit to some of these conversations and to the points that they're making, you know, figure out your niche, figure out and speak to your people and all these things, it's great. But then there's also the, the dynamic of what does it look like to, yes, lean into who you're speaking to and the content you're creating while also making space for other people who are also serving in the space and doing really good work because you're actually going to see your greater vision and your mission being met when you invite other people in instead of trying to own the whole market. Because Emily, like you said, like you're going to get exhausted. It's, I mean, I would so much rather have a list that's so long. I can't, I don't have enough fingers and toes to name off all the people in the space that I could recommend someone to. So they could really find someone that works for them and speaks their language. And they just totally eat up all their stuff and they're living out the goodness in their marriage. NFP is making sense to them. Sex is great. Their kids are thriving. Like that would be amazing. And, and it's hard, you know, it's, it's great that you can think of like, oh yeah, Christopher West is the one guy. But at the same time, I'm like, this is so sad. He's the one guy. Like, I'm sure he would love to say, and here are 20 others. And I think there are, but we're so quick to just spotlight one person because we're so uncomfortable, I think, as Catholics in this space as it is, thanks to Jansenism, 
um, that we just don't really, we're like, no, we'll leave it to that one guy who's super comfortable to talk about these things. And let's just like check it off the box, call it a good day and we'll move on. And Bridget, when did you start managing your fertility? When did your website launch? Um, so it was a part of the given Institute. I was a part of the first group to go through that in 2016, two months before I got married. <laughs> um, and then I worked on it that year and launched, I did like a soft launch in 2017 as part of how, how given was set up at the time, you know, you would launch it within the year and start utilizing your project. And I realized in the time of building it, I was like, well, one, I'm learning a lot as a newly married person around NFP, um, and it's going beyond just like picking a method, it's living it out. And two, this is requiring a lot more connection and research than I even realized. Um, so I launched July of 2018 and then just kind of had it as like a side, very side project. And I worked full time in government communications. So I, it was mainly my happy place of like designing graphics and stuff like that. <laughs> well, but like what I'm saying, what I'm getting at is that like you were like, as far as I know, one of the first in this space doing what we're all trying to do. And I've told you this before, but I remember hearing you on a podcast because I started taking back the terms initially around 2016, 2017. Okay. And then I discovered your website and it was the only one like it, uh, like it's kind. So I would like share it in all my resources. When I was speaking, I would put it as a resource. And then I heard you, was it the Catholic feminist? Did she have you yeah, on? That, that was my first podcast interview. Uh, yeah. Oh, it was your first podcast interview? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You did really well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I remember we had first moved to the North shore and I was riding my bike and on the lake and it was before or right before we, we adopted Bella. And I remember listening to it and it was kind of like what I was trying to do, but like you were so far ahead of me. And I just remember looking up to you so much and then years pass, we connect. And just like Emily did for you, you did that for me because you were so kind, you were so encouraging. And still the fact that like you like to work with me is just, it's kind of amazing, but it's been so encouraging to me as well. So just another example of how we're building each other up, all having the same goal. It's just, I just love looking at it from that perspective. You know, I did not know all that. So thank you for oh, telling me. Okay. I, thought I, told you I knew you had heard it on the podcast, but I didn't, I didn't realize, you know, just like the little pieces of what you were thinking about. Cause I think, man, the devil just tries to kick us in the teeth and kick us to the curb and thinking that like, we don't need to show up. And if one person's doing it, like, oh, my voice probably isn't, it doesn't matter. And like, you know, in theology, the body terms, it's like, you are unique and unrepeatable in creation and your voice and everything that you do. Like God gives us a specific mission in our lives. And it doesn't mean like, oh, I need to be the one person doing it. Like that just doesn't even make sense. But I, I think just, you know, in so much of business language, it's like, well, there's just the one person and you want to be the number one, blah, blah, blah in this field. And everyone goes to you. And it's like, I mean, I'm not a multi-billion dollar corporation. So what? No, like, I'm not going to do that. And like, while yes, I do need to make money to help support my family and to grow this business, to create more resources, to hire teams, um, it just doesn't make sense to, to pit each other against each other. I just, it, it makes no sense. It doesn't actually help us like win and push the larger movement forward to get women better care and better answers, better instructors, better, better everything. And we lose that when we get so inward focused. And I think that's the temptation that the devil gives to all of us. And I think for those who are listening, we're like, I'm not Catholic. What do you mean the devil? It's like, well, okay, bad juju, bad vibes, whatever your bad thing is that holds you back imposter syndrome, like, you know, like knock it off because like, that's where mindset work is so important and realizing connection is actually going to deepen the relationships and the work moving forward. Yeah. And I think, you know, kind of when you were talking, the thing that I always think about is like, if we really want to be an actual alternative to birth control. If we really want to say and own that we are here in this space to serve the best interests of women, we have to accept that one size does not fit all because that is the birth control mentality, right? That one size fits all. You just get this one pill, you get this one IUD, you get, you get this one formula to change your entire body and it might go great, and it might not, but you know what, whether it does or not, we don't really care as long as you don't get pregnant. And it's like that, you know, if we are going to be this, you know, one person has to be it in this space, we're no better than birth control. No better at all. Like we really don't care because 
every single one of us, you know, like Bridget, I know that for you, it's, you know, you want to reach out like to diocese and really help to strengthen the way that they teach it. And Mary and I are like, we want to get messy. Like let's meet users where they are. And like, let's talk with charters. Like I like we've had this conversation so many times. I love getting into my DMs with people and, you know, being in that coaching space and, and, you know, just mm-hmm. listening to like the, the stuff that people have to go through with this lifestyle. And I know we've talked and you're like, I could never do that. And it's like, great. You know, like there's nothing wrong with that. It's like, right. that's, it's not your gift and your gift is not mine. Like, I don't want to deal with diocese because that's bureaucracy. Like, no, I'll give them the resources, but you guys figure out how they get distributed. Um, so it's like, you know, but that's, that's the beauty of this is that we're not all trying to do everything. Mm -hmm. We all recognize what we're good at and we do it and we see it and we support it. And it's not a threat. It's just, you're doing something similar, but different. And that's great. And that helps me because that's something I don't have to worry about. I can focus on what I'm good at and let you do what you're good at. And it's great. Yeah. The recognition of like boundary setting and saying no, and, and realizing that you don't have to do it all is huge because that prevents burnout. And that also really helps again, going back to like collaboration and opportunities to collaborate because it's like, wait, I don't really think either this is a part of my goals or my skill set or whatever it might be, but I know someone else who's doing this. I know someone else who's interested in this. I know someone else who needs, you know, like the motivation to be reminded that like she should actually turn this into a business because her blog or ideas or ministry, or whatever could totally serve so many more people. And just to be able to like provide, I think that community and that inspiration for people and to build each other up is huge because then I think when we accept our own skills and gifts maybe where we want to grow maybe where we want to step back we're able to focus on other to see like how we can celebrate other people and encourage them because we're not obsessing over like oh but they're doing that well I should change my profile picture too because she just updated her profile picture and like maybe if I have a different one then everybody's gonna love me and choose me and it's like whoa chill the f out like that's not needed that's also not the main purpose or point of what you do like you want to be able to celebrate and go wow i love your new profile picture i love how you're reaching out and you are connecting with your clients now that's amazing i'm going to refer you to like all the people i'm working with because i can't offer that i don't want to offer that and that's so freeing that's so freeing to be able to do that i mean we also quite literally can't do it all like we objectively can't. So the more we would try to do it all, the more it's going to affect our ability to do what we're actually called to do. It's going to affect our mental health. It's going to affect the people that we care for, you know? So we really actually are serving ourselves and others better by sharing the wealth, so to speak, and really, you know, making space and keeping that space for other people who are supposed to be in it. Mm-hmm. That reminds me of um, St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta has a quote that the devil will try to distract you by a lot of good things, a lot of good works, a lot of good opportunities and jobs to prevent you from doing the one thing that you are called to do and called to do well and to like leave a legacy on the world with. And I I think about that a lot because it's like the temptation for me of just like, I want to do it all, that grasping. I'm, I think in the past couple of years, I've gotten a little bit better at seeing it more quickly where oftentimes I wouldn't see it until I was in burnout or like stress mode. I was like, why am I freaking out at like small things and my kids and my family and like my friends, like what's happening. And it's like that tune in and that check-in of like, oh, I'm trying to do everything when like, I don't need to. And I, and I can't, like you said, Mary, like we, we actually can't do it all. We're not supposed to. Yeah. And I think, you know, for me, the thing that I love about collaboration is the opportunity to learn and to grow. Um, When I first started Total Wine, like one of the things, you know, I wanted to get into writing and editing and I wanted to hone my skills as editing and editing. And so I was like, well, I have to have other people writing for me. So I started reaching out to people. I was like, hey, would you write something? Would you write something? And like, so I like I could edit it and I could like start to get better at that. And in this space, like having, being able to promote other people, connecting with other people, collaborating with other people helps me develop as a person, you know, helps me develop because I'm considering other perspectives and I'm talking to other people who are talking to people that I don't talk to. 
And so it's not just their own unique perspective, but it's also this unique perspective shaped by their unique experiences. And so I get to glean all of these things and it totally changes and informs and um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, enriches the way that I speak and the way that I interact with others, because I'm thinking, oh, maybe like this person is similar to that story that I heard, you know, or something like that. Like I'm able to bring that into those conversations and to consider things that in my limited experience, I never could have been able to. Yeah. I really like that because I, I think it, like you said, it, it enriches and it broadens perspective to, to have compassion for the people that you're serving. This is a tender space to talk about women's health because there are so many different stories, you know, no matter where you are, whether it's related to your fertility, to being able to have kids or not, to dealing with painful experiences like physical pain, emotional pain, um, marital intimacy thing. Like there's so many places that like, wounds, trauma, everything is like compacted in that space. And so like, I think by seeing other people's perspectives, even if you don't agree with everything that they do or say, it's like, you know, I'm not going to just eliminate this person's voice because maybe I don't agree with their political standing or how they choose to do, you know, what, whatever it might be in their life. Like, but this is their story. And this actually can connect with so many other women who are struggling and seeking community and to be able to have someone, someone, anyone to actually just listen to them and to hear the the challenge or the struggle or the frustration that they have. And I think that, um, that, that gets missed and especially in the social media world right now. And especially where we are, um, with everything going on in our world. Um, it's I, not that any time I don't want to glorify the past. Like it's been easier in the past either. I think we're in a really, I think we're in a great time right now. Like we are obviously made to be here in this time and place. I think there's an opportunity for increased compassion and connection and understanding of each other without, without giving up the desire and this, the search for truth, for beauty, for goodness, because it's not this legalistic. It's either that or it's that it, there's so much more, I think, nuance and gray that we're seeing in people and it's okay to recognize it, to lean into it and to say, I see you in this. It doesn't mean I agree with you. It doesn't mean like, oh yeah, I agree with the way that you're handling it or you know, responding to it or voting or whatever, but it's saying I acknowledge you as a human being and that you are going through the same challenges and frustrations and struggles that I am also going through. And that doesn't mean I get to just like put you out because you just happen to have something to say that I don't agree with when there's so much that we could agree on. And this idea of collaboration goes beyond organizations. This is an idea that we really need to, to pull out and extrapolate in other areas. You know, like you're talking about working with different people and bringing different experiences to the table. You know, there's so it's so important to include people with different experiences, especially when we're talking about women's health. We have people with surprise pregnancies and infertility, and then we have postpartum, and then we have like trauma, and we have experiences with sex and marriage. There's so many different perspectives that we need to all bring in to the same place, you know? And then if also, if you look at the individual, for example, infertility, and sometimes I know at least, you know, when I was experiencing infertility at the beginning, when it was really hard, I had all that focus on um, becoming a biological, you know, a mother to a biological child and focusing on that one thing rather than like focusing on all the gifts God has given me and like all these other ways he's calling me to be fruitful. This applies in so many different dimensions. And it just shows the importance of that we're not just one thing, nor should we be just one thing. So um, yeah, just another thing to bring to the table, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. You know, it's, um, it's really interesting because I see so much of like what you're talking about, Mary, like in, in these different conversations, so many people, they have their experience and it becomes kind of a blinder lens through which they see the world. And I'm not condemning that. I totally understand that I was there. Um, but that's the purpose of listening to other people's experiences, not to minimize your own, but just to understand that, there are other people who might see your situation differently, or when you say something would react in a totally different way, like words that might be healing to you might be harmful to someone else. And understanding the, all of these different experiences, it, it, it really helps us to become good communicators 
And it helps us to understand ourselves and then in that process of understanding ourselves, we actually become more open to understanding other people. And like you were saying, Bridget, like, I'm not going to dismiss you because you don't agree with me theologically or politically. I'm going to see you first as a human being and consider the fact that, you know, if you, if I had been in your shoes, I'd probably be exactly where you were to recognize that there's really not that big of a difference between us. Like when you, when you actually look at the core of our humanity, there's really not that big of a difference. And it absolutely applies here in this space. When we're talking about collaboration, when we're talking about reaching, reaching other women, like, yes, we all have our own voice. We all have our own unique perspective. We all have kind of our own filter and that's good. That's exactly the way that it should be but that we're constantly using that filter to grow and to see things from other perspectives. And it's hard, like I'm not saying it's easy and I'm not saying it's comfortable. It is, it's very uncomfortable because to sit in that space with somebody who's saying something that you do not agree with, but taking a step back and recognizing it is far more important for me to meet the human being than to walk away being right. That's hard, but it is so fruitful. I can't tell you the number of times that I have, I, first of all, that I have become a better person, but also that I've been able to reach people because I was like, you know what? I think that this is a really bad thing. And I really want to tell you, but I'm not going to, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to listen. And I'm going to recognize that like, there is so much more to this story you're telling me than you could ever say. And I'm just going to meet you where you are with what you have shared. And that's more than enough. And it's not about me. It's about them. And I feel like I've gone on a little tangent here, but it, I, I think it does tie in with like what we're talking about is this ability to recognize um, the importance of those different perspectives and those unique gifts. And, you know, like we could, we could get into talking about like method wars. It's like, I, you know, I've used three different methods and I have my issues with the two that didn't work, but I also, you know, I used to like, want to go on like a crusade against the like symptothermal and Creighton. And then I talked to women who love symptothermal and I talked to women who love Creighton, like actually my conversations with Mary about how Creighton helped her. And I was like, Oh, right. Like, okay. It was the, the problem was, is that it was not the right fit for me. It's not that it's a bad method. It's that it was not the right one for me, but it is the right one for someone. And so having that experience, I was like, okay, I need to change the way I talk. It's not about me just having a beef with somebody. It's about, okay, no, this just didn't work for me, but it does work for people. And let's start to think about who those women are and, and talk about it in that way. Well, also our two different fertility background experiences too, Emily. I mean, like before I met you, I had this very narrow-minded view of suffering and well, to a certain extent with infertility, I just was so wrapped up in my own pain and how I've lived it and experienced other women. And, but when I talked to you and actually listened to your experiences that were opposite of mine, it really pushed me to consider the sufferings on the other end of the perspective, on the other end of the spectrum, I should say the fertility spectrum. And, and then also, you know, but it requires that openness too to say like, okay, um, I'm suffering in an op opposite way, but suffering is universal. And we're both actually learning like very similar lessons, even though we're having these opposite experiences and wow, how much I've grown from those conversations. It's just really helped me to become a better person and thus a better person in this space too, to connect to other women um, and just using a broader language when talking to them. Mm -hmm. There's so much, there's so much that we can do to connect with other women and just, I think like to, to meet them where they're at. And I think we, hopefully, I think this conversation, even just hearing, you know, each of you speaking, I'm just like, wow, there's so many opportunities for us to be vulnerable with each other and to actually show up for each other, you know, that we don't have to be closed off. I think, I think this is where, um, feminism it has really been a challenge for so many because I don't know if you guys have read Holistic Feminism by Leah Jacobson, but it's like the book that I recommend because she does such a good job of walking through historically what's going on at the time of the of the new of the different waves. And I think with with second and third wave feminism, there was so much around women against 
men, women against women. And, and there wasn't this sense of understanding like, wait, how do we collaborate with each other? How do we actually lean into each other? And I think this is where we're seeing a fourth wave emerging that so many are starting to talk about because women are so tired. We're so tired of, of being mean. I think we're so tired of just exhausting each other, of nitpicking each other. Like we don't, we don't, nobody desires that. You know, I think that's why so many, you know, envy when they see healthy female relationships, you know, even if it's on TV in a show, it's like, oh, I just want that. I want to be able to just like reach out to a friend and have that compassion and that understanding. And like, I, I am someone that I'm grateful to be able that I can say like, yeah, I have women in my life who celebrate me who support me, who, who will walk with me. And like, do I agree with them and everything that I do? And do we vote the same way? Do we go to church? Get No, with some of them, I don't. But I think the beauty of being able to see each other as human beings and to see, I think the gratitude and recognizing the goodness that they bring helps fill in that gap, you know, along with, you know, I believe it's like God coming in too, to fill that gap, to recognize, like, here's where you guys are like, actually like pretty dang close to each other and similar in a lot of different ways that you can help each other. If we're willing, if, and if I should say, if I'm willing to listen, if I'm willing to just like lean in to the discomfort that you guys are both talking about where it is uncomfortable, it's super uncomfortable. It'd be way easier just to like cancel everybody that doesn't agree with me and only hang out with people who hundred percent agree with me. But then again, I don't think I could find one person that hundred percent agrees with me. My husband and I don't agree on everything. So how the heck am I supposed to find anybody else? Like, and we're supposed to be equally yoked and hanging out together to become one all that stuff. And yet we're our own persons. So we have to be willing to change and to be um, not giving up our values. It's not that it's, it's an openness to all the gray that exists beyond the framework, the 10 commandments, the be a kind human, all that stuff. Like it's, it's actually pretty gray. It's a big, huge field that you get to go run in. And that's a little bit terrifying. And speaking yeah. of women, going from women being mean to each other to like supporting each other, I saw the greatest Facebook post the other day. It said, find yourself a friend who prays for you behind your back. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that great? I love that. Yeah, no, this is like, this is, I, I think honing in on the discomfort and the vulnerability of this. I don't think we can, like, I don't think that we can minimize that because that's a huge thing. Like, you know, Mary and I talk a lot about how our very different experiences, like how we've actually grown a lot by sharing that. Well, let me tell you something. It was not always easy. We missed each other a lot. And, but like, we kept like trying to like, okay, what is actually going on? There was this desire to like, get kind of get to the bottom of things like what, okay, I said this wrong because I was coming at it from this place. And there was always this willingness to like, step back and say, okay, what's actually going on here? And that's hard. And, and it really, you know, it's interesting hearing you talking about, about feminism and like second and third wave and how there's this fourth wave, like, thank you, Jesus. Okay. Um, <laughs> like, please let's have something good come in here. Cause I'm tired. You're right. We're all so tired of this competition, whether it's our body type or like what our life looks like, or whether we're successful in a career or we're married and have kids or whatever it is. Like we, we find like what our wardrobe looks like. We find everything to compete over. Yeah. And it's just like, there's not like, you know, you were talking about being equally yoked with your husband, but you don't agree. Duh. We think that being equal means we're the same. Yeah. No, no. If we, this is like, this is the thing that I, I thought about this years ago. If we were the same, we would be fundamentally unequal because we are all completely different. And so if all of a sudden something came in and made us all the same, we would be completely unequal because we would be held to a standard that we were not able to meet. One person could meet it. Nobody else could meet it. We would be fundamentally unequal. And so recognizing that equality means that we're all different because we are, you know, we're unique and unrepeatable that's a fact. And it just, you know, so trying to compare, you know, whenever we were little kids, I remember like my mom would always say, oh, you're comparing apples and oranges. It's like, that's literally what we're doing when we're comparing and competing woman to woman. We're not the same. And I think that's one of the things that fertility awareness really brings to the forefront is that our cycles are unique. They're, you know, which is annoying and frustrating. I get it. You know, we, the, the nice thing about birth control is that it makes you uniform but at a very high cost. Um, 
but it would be nice. It would be so nice if we had this predictable 28 day cycle that we could predict the symptoms and all of these types of things, but it doesn't work like that. Yeah. And I think, you know, leaning into embracing that we don't have control over the ways that we're different. And that's not a bad thing. I think to a certain degree, it is a little bit about that desire to control. Um, but yeah, it just, yeah, we're all different and that's good. Like, no, we can't get the like, co competition is pointless because we're not competing against like things. You could also say that's the downfall of birth control, that it makes us all the same when we're in fact all different. You know, fertility awareness appreciates the fact that every woman is individual and unique and allows that to flourish, really. It just makes me think, well, a lot of things like one, we all desire to live in technicolor. We all we all want to live in technicolor. Nobody wants to live in black and white. You know, just like we want to see things vividly. We want to experience things vividly. And I can think about, you know, even women that I worked with where I think we saw this disparity of women who looked happy and beautiful online, you know, and then you look at your own life, you're like, well, I'm getting my kids ready for daycare. I'm packing lunches. I'm heading to my job. And then my tire went flat and it's snowing and whatever else. And so it doesn't look glamorous and sunshiny and, you know, the vibrant blogger preset, but it's, it's in the little things, it's in our real lives where we have the opportunity to make these little changes, to see the other person as human, to lean into gratitude of our own life and to actually, we can be happy in the life that we have. We don't have to, you know, live in the beach house in California, but if you do invite me, because that sounds amazing, but there isn't this there, you know, this idea that like, once I have this, then I've made it like, this is it this is it. You could get hit by a car or die tomorrow or something could happen. Like this is your, our real life. So what are we doing to lean into them and to not just, you know, coast through. And I, I mean, I get like, there are hard seasons, there are hard things we go through. And sometimes we are just making it through and that there's, there's still good in that. There's something happening in that. But I think, you know, so often we're, we're stuck in this reality or, not, not a reality, but a, a false reality of thinking that someday I'll make it someday. I'll, you know, I'll learn my body or I'll be free or I'll have good relationships. Like it takes work. And I think that's something that, you know, you guys do so much of, I mean, I try to as well, like just talking about the honesty with fertility awareness, with understanding your body, with, you know, showing up for people, like it's hard work. It is work. And, the, and to sugarcoat it and say, like, it's just beautiful and awesome. Like, no, any more than if you're trying to grow a habit or a skill or in virtue, like you have to put in the work, it will be uncomfortable, but the process to get there is, is worth it. And I think, you know, we all have examples in our lives where we've done something and it was like, man, that was brutal, but I am so glad that I did go through that. Or I learned that skill because now I'm able to, to do X, Y, Z. And I think we can all think of those moments. No. And it doesn't have to be, you know, like, and uh, now I've you know, summited this mountain peak and it was amazing. Like it can be the smallest thing. Like now I wake up every morning at the same time and get my workout in. And that's my win that, you know, it's, it's, there's such a variety. And I think, again, it's recognizing that variety of our own lives and what we're all called to. And I think that can be the temptation with, I think even within the, the fertility awareness space with methods too, like, oh, my friend uses Creighton and she says she loves it. Well, I'm trying Creighton and it's not working for me. And there's that temptation to say, okay, well, Creighton's, you know, like Emily, you were saying like, well, Creighton's just dumb. And it's like, well, wait, maybe it's just not for me. And that's kind of scary to say, because it can feel like, well, what am I doing wrong? Is something wrong with me? Am I broken? Am I messed up? Am I stupid? It's like, no, this just isn't a good fit for you. And that's okay. But that takes so much more vulnerability to say that then to just wipe it all off and say like, no, it's all dumb and it doesn't work. And I think that's a, that's a scary reality, especially when you're, when you're getting off birth control, when you are trying to learn, or when you're trying, you know, trying something in this space to be um, more authentically yourself and trying to learn your body. Like those are, those are intense and things to, that you have to work through and process that if you don't have someone to do it with too, like that, it just compounds on each other. I don't know really where I'm going with this, but it's kind, of, it. it's kind of addressing all these different pieces. But I realize as I'm talking, I'm like, what does this really no, have to do? You were going on a great oh, little that thing was, right there. I was like, <laughs> just please continue. I was all for it. Um, yeah. No, and it's like yeah. actually a great way to kind of start wrapping this up. We're actually going to put you on the spot a little bit, Bridget. Oh, that's okay. okay. <laughs> that's so evil. I've got my like evil hands going here. <laughs> Grab my coffee. But um, <laughs> you kind of... <laughs> 
teed it up pretty well because you're talking about the honesty of 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 sharing fertility awareness and yep. its practice. Um, so we want to know, can you give us your elevator pitch for fertility awareness? Oh, the face. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly Give why we a didn't second to you. think about it, but I think you were heading in the right direction, you know, talking about honesty, how it's practiced, you know, consider what, what things that, you know, somebody who's never heard of fertility awareness in their life, and you just had an elevator ride with them. <laughs> but also These questions always first. terrify me. And then it's always going to be later, <laughs> like when I'm in the shower and I'm going to be like, oh, that's what I meant to say. Um, but it is, a, it is a good question because it's like, we have so many elevator pitch moments with women that were like, you know, in the store with, or, you know, we're outside of an elevator on a walk, something like that. I think fertility awareness is leaning into who you are made to be and understanding who you are and recognizing your individuality is good through understanding your body, understanding how you work, um, respecting your body, your mental health, your physical health, um, you know, your spiritual health and, honoring who you are, honoring your journey, like making sure that you're getting the care and the, and the rest and making sure you get what you're, what you need to be able to be functioning. Well, not just like barely functioning, but like being alive, living in Technicolor, making sure that you actually are living a full life that you, that you love the reality that you live. And I think you're not turning by not turning off your body by actually engaging with yourself. It is uncomfortable, but there's so much healing that comes from that. And from there, so much can blossom to say like, wow, I really need to take care of my mental health with therapy or medication. I really need to be working with my doctor on this, or I need to have uncomfortable and hard conversations with my spouse around sex and family planning. And while it's hard in the moment, it gives you the opportunity to grow and to be able to lean into who you are, your own, your own unique story, instead of turning away from it, you lean into it and embrace it. Even, even the gross parts that maybe you're ashamed of to be able to, you know, it's almost like looking at your former, your younger self, not your former self, your younger self and saying like, I see you and I love you and I care about you. And to have that compassion as you move forward in your story too, to recognize that like you're worthy of compassion and you're worthy of taking care of yourself. Beautiful. Emily, it's so interesting. Wouldn't you say we've had many answers that kind of sound like that like getting to the core of who we are as women it's very yeah very consistent. And it's just, just for what it's worth Bridget we sprung this on um Christina our mutual friend Christina Valenzuela and when her the first word that came out of her, her mouth was no <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we were like you know what whenever we have friends on we're not telling them about this question of course you know after the season airs if people listen they'll know um but yeah I was just it's good to get like an honest awesome. like, first, yeah and you're your bug eyes for those who are listening and not watching Bridget's eyes shot out of her head with that question, because it is hard to answer. It's like, what is your elevator pitch? There's so much, oh my gosh, where do I start? Where do I end? Um, and am I going to freak the person out? And is that bad or is that good? You know, <laughs> and just bring a lot of questions, but yeah, fundamentally, being a, you know, learning your unique fertility is about learning who you are in the most intimate level, mm-hmm. learning that all the aspects of you are totally integrated and that, you know, when you're stressed because of like relational issues or because of work issues, like your ovaries are going to react, you know, and it sucks, but like that helps you to tune in and be like, okay, work is really stressful right now. Do I need to adjust or is this actually, this is just what it's going to be for now. And maybe I just need to come up with like some better coping, you know, those types of examples. And like, it helps you to be introspective about really hard stuff, which we don't like to be because we like to have a pill that just makes it go away. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be your fertility. It could be a headache. It could be anything. We like pills that make our problems go away, but there's something there is a, there's a quality of life that comes after that really arduous, messy journey through self-awareness and it's worth it. It just takes a long time and that's okay. You yeah, can't think sorry. of any like, like, tack on, no, but. <laughs> no, it's so good because I, I can't think of anyone who's gone through challenging things. And again, a range, maybe it's habit, habit building and getting up at, at the same time every morning, or it's 
uh, I don't know, swimming the ocean. I'm not really sure, but whatever it is, like I've never heard someone regret putting in the work at the end, like in it. Yeah. They're not loving it. They're stumbling. It's challenging. But at the end of that, that journey, it's like, there's almost like a hunger for more. It's like, Hey, I'm doing this. What, what else can I do now? Like that, I think it's sometimes a disbelief of how strong we are and how capable we actually are to do hard things. We're wired for hard things. Like if we don't, my business coach has, has said this and I, and I think about it so much lately, we're, we're made for hard things. And when we're not doing hard things, we turn the mundane into hard things that should not be hard. We turn like laundry into a really hard thing when it's really laundry is not that hard to do. Like we can habit build that in and habit stack, you know, if you're into atomic habits, but it's really like, what is that thing that could push us to the next level? Maybe it's like going to therapy. Maybe it's, um, pursuing a degree. Maybe it's playing intentionally with our kids, whatever that might be. That's actually the hard thing. Like we can do it, but if we're not pushing ourselves and challenging ourselves to grow and change often, we're going to turn things that don't need to be hard into hard things. And I just keep thinking about that because, wow, I totally do that when I'm not focused on a bigger goal outside of myself. Yeah. The hard stuff is literally how we grow. I mean, it's how we evolve. I feel so called out right now. (laughs) Just thought I'd throw that in there. Anyway. Join the club, I guess. (laughs) Just challenging in itself, huh? Anyway. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining us, Bridget. Um, This was great. This was so much fun. Um, I hope everybody listening enjoyed it. You know, again, we didn't plan this episode, but I think it turned out great. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for all of the work that you're doing to help women. I think it's huge. I'm so grateful to be connected with you both and to chat with you every day and to know that I could reach out and ask questions and to learn from you both. I think you're great. And I'm just so excited to see where fan base goes. I know it will go far. And I'm just really grateful to be a part of the, the early process and seeing it launching off and taking off to help women. It's great. Well, back at you. We know managingyourfertility.com. It's .com, right? The .com, yes. yes. Doing big things as well. And we could not be more thrilled to share this space with you, honestly. Um, so we're honored to have you on our podcast today. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. As always, it's lovely having conversations with you. To our listeners, thank you for spending some time with us. And we are looking forward to next time. Y'all have a great day.